sector-wise reforms in India. The word agriculture is adapted from a Latin word agricultura which literally meant tillage of a field that is cultivation of land for raising crops. Agriculture has played a key role in the development of human civilization. Today, India ranks second worldwide in farm output and agriculture employs 52% of the total workforce. Agriculture provides the principal means of livelihood for over 58.4% of India's population. It contributes approximately one-fifth of the total gross domestic product GDP. Agriculture accounts for about 10% of the total export earnings. It provides raw material to a large number of industries. India, with a predominantly rural economy, lives in villages. More than 72% of the population are rural settlers and about 60% of the workforce depends upon agriculture-related activities like animal husbandry, forestry, fishing, etc. for their daily living. About just less than half of its national income is still derived from agriculture and allied activities. This sector further counts for nearly 35% of the country's total GDP and also supplies raw materials for industries which are spreading by leaps and bounds. Steps taken by the Indian government to change the state of Indian agriculture. During the British period, the state of Indian agriculture was very weak. After independence, the Indian government made many policies for the betterment of the same. This included land reforms and land sealing system. Land reforms. Land reforms involves changing of laws, regulations or customs regarding land ownership. Land reform may consist of a government initiated or government backed property redistribution, generally of agricultural land. Land reforms can therefore refer to transfer of ownership from the more powerful to the less powerful, that is from a relatively small number of wealthy owners with extensive land holdings to individual owners who used to till the land. This was also one of the steps taken by the government to eradicate the inequality in the distribution of land. There were a large number of cultivators who owned relatively less land. Against this, a few of the landowners had large land holdings. This led to growing disparity in income in the rural areas. To wipe out this difference, the act was thought of. The first five-year plan mentions where land is managed directly by the substantial owners and there are no tenants in occupation. Public interest requires that there should be an absolute limit to the amount of land which any individual may hold. The ceiling on land holdings was intended to meet the land needs of the landless, reduce the glaring inequalities in land ownership so that it may lead to development of cooperative rural economy and enlarge self-employment in owned land as distinguished from subletting and tenant cultivation. However, the progress of ceiling legislation was disappointing. It was found that only about 23 lakh acres of land was declared surplus. Of this, only about 13 lakh acres were redistributed. In Bihar, Karnataka, Orissa and Rajasthan, no land was declared surplus. It was mainly due to partitioning of land or Benami transfers. Green Revolution in India Let us take a quick look at the various factors due to which food security was a paramount item on Free India's agenda. 
The British government attributed the same to acute shortfall in food production in the area. Indian economist Amartya Sen established that food shortage was no doubt a contributor to the problem. But a more important factor was the result of hysteria related to World War II, which made food supply a low priority for the British rulers. Even though the British left India four years later in 1947, India continued to be haunted by the memories of the Bengal famine. It was therefore but natural that food security was a paramount item on Free India's agenda. Thus, it was necessary to ensure that enough legislative measures were taken to ensure that businessmen would never again be able to hoard food for their personal benefit. Simultaneously, it was necessary to think of ways and means to increase food production in India. Thus, the introduction of high-yielding varieties of seeds after 1965 and the increased use of fertilizers and irrigation are known collectively as the Green Revolution. The major objective was to bring about a substantial increase in production needed to make India self-sufficient in food grains. Double cropping was a primary feature of the Green Revolution. This meant that instead of taking one crop season per year, the decision was made to have two crop seasons per year. New strains of high yield value HYV seeds were developed, mainly wheat and rice, but also millet and corn. The most noteworthy HYV seed was the K68 variety of wheat. Some achievements of the Green Revolution The Green Revolution resulted in a record grain output of 131 million tons in 1978-79. This established India as one of the world's biggest agricultural producers. No other country in the world which attempted the Green Revolution recorded such level of success. India also became an exporter of food grains around that time. The crop area under HYV varieties grew from 7% to 22% of the total cultivated area during the 10 years of the Green Revolution. More than 70% of the wheat crop area, 35% of the rice crop area and 20% of the millet and corn crop area used HYV seeds. It also created job opportunities in different industries. India could pay back all loans it had taken from the World Bank and its affiliates for the purpose of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution, howsoever impressive, has not succeeded in making India totally and permanently self-sufficient in food. In 1979 and 1987, India faced severe drought conditions due to poor monsoons. Last year, India imported sugar. In November 2010, there was unseasonal rainfall in some onion-producing regions, due to which there was an abundant shortage of onions, which also resulted in the enormous rise in price. India has failed to extend the concept of high yield value seeds to all crops or all regions. In terms of crops, it remained largely confined to food grains only, not to all kinds of agricultural produce. In regional terms, only Punjab and Haryana states showed the best results of the Green Revolution. The eastern plains of the river Ganges in West Bengal state also showed reasonably good results but results were less impressive in other parts of India. The HYV seeds are more prone to risks. Moreover, it was feared that the Green Revolution would increase the disparities between rich and poor farmers. Besides, there are places like Kalahandi in India's eastern state of Orissa, where famine-like conditions have been existing for many years and where some starvation deaths have also been reported. Such things again raise the question whether the Green Revolution has failed in its overall social objectives, though it has been a resounding success in terms of agricultural production.
Hence, the Green Revolution cannot be considered as 100% successful. Some interesting facts. Noted agronomist Dr. M. S. Swaminathan from India led the Green Revolution. Dr. Norman Borlaug of the US supported the Green Revolution through the introduction of high yielding variety of wheat seeds. Dr. Norman Borlaug was presented India's second highest civilian honor, the Padma Vibhushan. Some developed countries, especially Canada, which were facing a shortage in agricultural labor, were so impressed by the results of India's Green Revolution that they asked the Indian government to supply them with farmers experienced in the methods of the Green Revolution. Many farmers from Punjab and Haryana states in northern India were thus sent to Canada, where they eventually settled. Subsidies What is a subsidy? A subsidy is a form of financial assistance paid to a business or economic sector. In most of the cases, subsidies are made by the government to producers or distributors in an industry to prevent the decline of that industry. Subsidies can be regarded as a form of protectionism or trade barrier by making domestic goods and services artificially competitive against imports. Government may subsidize fertilizers in order to induce farmers to procure more and use it extensively in the farms. This may eventually result in increasing the per hectare output, which is the ultimate motive of the government. This means that the subsidy changes the price exogenously to alter the demand and supply figures. The most controversial classes of subsidies across the world are fuel subsidies and agricultural subsidies. The major types of subsidies in India are agriculture subsidies and food subsidies. Subsidies help in achievement of social policy objectives including redistribution of income and population control. Subsidies assist in controlling the prices to maintain stability. In countries like India, where food is the basic right of all, and social inequality is rampant. Government intervention becomes a necessity. A quick look at subsidy in India and its further classification. Even though subsidies are of great help, there is a lot of controversy surrounding them. It is of utmost necessity on the part of the government to ensure that the advantages of subsidy are enjoyed by the small and needy farmers. Let us take an example of fertilizer subsidy. India has been providing farmers with heavily subsidized fertilizer for more than three decades. A few of the controversies related to fertilizer subsidy are as shown. Subsidies by themselves are neither good nor bad. However, certain factors have to be taken into consideration. For example, reducing the overall scale of subsidies, making subsidies as transparent as possible, and using them for well-defined economic objectives. Subsidies should focus on maximizing their impact on the target population at minimum cost. This can be achieved by instituting systems for periodic review of subsidies and setting clear limits on duration of any new subsidy schemes. India at the time of independence At the time of independence, Indian industrialists did not have the capital for investment in industrial ventures, nor was the market big enough to encourage industrialists to undertake major projects even if they had the capital to do so. It was principally for these reasons that the state had to play an extensive role in promoting the industrial sector. The decision to develop the state along socialist lines meant that the policies of the private sector would have to be complementary to those of the public sector, with the public sector leading the way. This was very evident in the composition of the early five-year plans. 
In accordance with the goal of the state, controlling the commanding heights of the economy, the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1956 was adopted. Industrial Policy Resolution 1956 The Industrial Policy Resolution 1956 widened the scope of the public sector. The objective was to accelerate economic growth and boost the process of industrialization as a means to achieving a socialistic pattern of society. Given the situation of scarce capital and inadequate entrepreneurial base, the resolution accorded a predominant role to the state to assume direct responsibility for industrial development. Thus, all industries of basic and strategic importance and those in the nature of public utility services, besides those requiring large-scale investment, were reserved for the public sector. The Industrial Policy Resolution 1956 classified industries into three categories. The first category comprised 17 industries, which was reserved only for the public sector. These included railways, air transport, arms and ammunition, iron and steel, and atomic energy. The second category comprised 12 industries, which were envisaged to be progressively state-owned, but private sector was expected to supplement the efforts of the state. The third category contained all the remaining industries, and it was expected that private sector would initiate development of these industries but they would remain open for the state as well. Despite the demarcation of industries into separate categories, the resolution was flexible enough to allow the required adjustments and modifications in the national interest. Another objective spelled out in the Industrial Policy Resolution 1956 was the removal of regional disparities through development of regions with low industrial base. Accordingly, adequate infrastructure for industrial development of such regions was duly emphasized. Given the potential to provide large-scale employment, the resolution restated the government's determination to provide all sorts of assistance to small and cottage industries for wider dispersal of the industrial base and more equitable distribution of income. Thus, the Industrial Policy Resolution became the basis to form the second five-year plan. Some interesting facts. To summarize, industrialization in India has undergone a gradual change. From the time Nehru visualized the public sector as temples of modern India and worked towards a centrally planned economy to the current scene where the opening of the economy has led to the inflow of foreign direct investment FDI. The Indian economy has turned full circle but the wheel of progress ensures that both the public sector units and the private sector serve as symbols of a modern India.